Welcome to What Is It About the Weather, where weather is always the theme, but the weather is seldom the topic. Now this week we're going to talk about weather sayings, weather lore, weather proverbs, whatever you want to call them, and whether they're fact or fiction. Now before we dive into the main topic, let's talk a little bit about some controversy in the weather world. Now I know, I know, a lot of you get your weather forecast every day and say it's controversial and that it's rigged and biased. In any case, let's uh, let's talk about something that happened in the media. Now, for those that aren't familiar with the process, you know, research is done all the time on whether it's in atmospheric science or any science field, you know, other fields as well. You know, history, uh, any of the arts and sciences, a lot of research is done, and for the mainstream, the terminology that's used around it, or what's been research can be, you know, sort of boring, may not be relatable. And so that doesn't mean that it's not important information. And that means that there are times when other people get involved in the process of conveying that information, that things can go awry. So, you know, whether it's a university press office or the general media, when they're trying to cover a story, they may try to spin it or put some other phrases around it. And, you know, the next thing you know, you have Sharknado. But most of the time, you know, it, it may come across as a little bit of exaggeration or the wording you go, okay, it wasn't quite that exciting or whatever. But again, hopefully that meant that you were a little more engaged in what you were reading or what you were, the story that you were following. But we do have cases where things just go kind of awry. And, I, and I've seen it with, you know, all these things, whether it's been mainstream media not understanding the idea really of, of what they're writing about. But a lot of times you have science writers and reporters that will cover scientific topics, and so they at least have a, a general knowledge. You know, so maybe the verbiage they chose wasn't the right verbiage. Can, again, it can even happen at the university level. They're, you know, they're trying to create some excitement around something, and, you know, it just somehow it, it gets a little off. But in this case, it went more than a little off. So we had a situation where the Science Channel, TV channel, now you would think, you know, if you had the Science Channel, that they would have at least a reasonable knowledge of scientific topics and present them in a reasonable way. Yet at the same time, we all know that with television, it's all about revenue, right? And end of day, I don't care whether, you know, we're talking HBO or whether we're talking the news, in the end, they've got to pay the bills. And so they're always trying to get you engaged. So there was a story that ran about the Bermuda Triangle. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a region from kind of the coast of Florida uh, up to the island of Bermuda down to Puerto Rico in the Atlantic Ocean. So it's this, again, you know, it's been described as a triangle because three points, that's what you get, right? But it's this general region where there have been quite a few unexplained disappearances of, of boats and airplanes and a lot of theories about why it's happened, but this recent kind of uh, dive into this, they, they ran a story that these mysterious hexagonal clouds were actually the cause of all the mystery is all solved, right? Which we always know that's seldom the case. But they went and interviewed a somebody actually who who provides input for this series, I guess, that... Uh, was on the channel. It's not just, oh, this wasn't a one-off. It's a recurring, you know, series that they run. And he gives answers sometimes or helps kind of fill in the science. I mean, that's, you go to experts, so of course things sound more credible. And his name is Randall Cerveni, or he goes by Randy in some of the other stories I've read about him. And he described these things called air bombs. Well, and so the part of it was on him. He gave some a name to something that is what we call a microburst, but it's a, a downward flow of air. And it can lead to these kind of voids in the clouds. But at the same time, he was just describing a general idea of, of things. And yeah, they, this a microburst, and anybody who's ever read about it or understands them knows that they could. They could put down a ship or a plane or something like that. However... To say that all of a sudden it, it solved this great mystery um, was way off course. And uh, he uh, I didn't didn't take kindly. Now, now he's he's actually seems pretty uh, lighthearted about the whole thing. But so it created a lot of controversy in, in the again in the weather world. I don't know outside it. But, you know, the, here's the challenge I run to in a day. This thing's still up on the science channel. 
and they're still presenting it as scientifically sound and all this stuff. And, you know, it's, it's like any of these things, whether you're watching a story on Bigfoot or you're watching a story on something like this and you go, huh, I've, I've gotten credible information. It seems plausible. And you walk away and not realizing that there's this whole after story. And it's always the challenge with this stuff is seldom people know when the real truth comes out what the real truth is on some of these things. In any case, Angela Fritz over at the Washington Post had a nice write-up about this thing, and I'll put a link in the show notes. But it talks about um, he had no idea that it was going to be used this way. Now, and he said he didn't he didn't see the edits before it, this thing went live, and he's kind of very much backed away from what the conclusions they've drawn and that sort of thing. But whether he'll still advise for this show or not, I don't know. You know, it's it's kind of one of these things again where, you know, fool me once. Shame on me, fool me twice. So, so we'll see. We'll see. I, it's not a it's not a series that I watch on a regular basis. So, uh, hopefully, well, I know better than to think that they'll do a clarifying episode. It's not in their best interest, right? The controversy, if anything, probably probably helps their ratings. So, they're probably not upset at all. The old the old adage: the only bad PR is no PR. All right, enough about controversial weather. Let's let's dive into the main topic. And we're going to talk about, you've heard me say it, and, and weather sayings, right? Weather lore, weather proverbs, whatever you want to call them. And, you know, I guess some of it just depends on how long the saying has been around. But we've all heard them, right? We've all had these things that we've heard related to the weather that are conveying some sort of information. Now, the information can be short-term, you know, this is a sign of what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. It can be something more long term. You know, this is a sign of what spring is, you know, we're in the fall or winter, and this is going to be what the spring's going to be like or the summer's going to be like. And there's a lot of context. This is not a new thing by any means, right? This is This is something that's gone on for a long time, all the way back to when written text began, I mean, there's a, there's a fame. So we've probably all heard it. You've all heard the one red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in morning, sailors take warning. Sometimes you, you for, for land lovers, they take it, they take sh- sailor out of it and put shepherd in any case, this actual proverb, not in, you know, modern English, but in its original text is in the Bible, right? It's in the new Testament. So we know written Weather proverbs have been around that long, and pro- again, probably go back as far as man has been observing weather, right? It, it's as long as we've been looking at it, there's a good chance that people, you know, we're a lot smarter than we give ourselves credit for sometimes. And, you know, you see a recurring pattern and you go, huh, every time it's a red sky at night, the next day seems to be okay. So, Maybe there's something to that. Even if you don't understand the science behind it, you know, we, we've done that for a long time. Now, on the flip side of that, as I've talked about before, you know, the Greeks talked about how wind in caves was causing earthquakes, which we know is, you know, really not a scientifically valid thing. So we don't always get it right, of course, but a lot of times we do. And there's, I found in doing the research, there's a great book called Weather Lore, a collection of proverbs, sayings, and rules concerning weather. Now, you'd think, oh, that sounds like something put together recently. This thing was written back in the late 1800s, okay? So it's, uh, you know, coming up on 100 and, I, you know, if I did the math, it was 125 years old or so, uh, 120 years old or so. So just before the turn of, you know, into 1900 or whatever, it's written by a man named Richard Inwards. And he was a president of the Royal Meteorological Society. Now, you know, as you've heard me mention, this is kind of the UK or the British equivalent to an organization we have here in the U.S. called the American Meteorological Society. But what was funny or what I found interesting was he was and held that position, but his primary occupation was a mining engineer. And it's a reminder to, you know, many people that a lot of times people that did this sort of work in our field, I know it wasn't their primary occupation. They got into it in, in the same thing. You know, a lot of these people got into it in military as well. And so it may have been something that grew out of other work they did or almost, you know, I don't want to use the word hobby, but let's call it a serious hobby. It wasn't how they got made, made a living in any case. And so this guy traveled the world and, and did, you know, worked in mines, uh, in South America, in, you know, other parts of the world. So 
It was interesting, and it's over 200 pages, okay, of these different sayings and these different phrases, and I, I've seen a reprint of it. You can get a reprint, but, you know, you, this may be something, the copy I saw was actually online, and it was, you know, at a university library, so there are editions of this thing sitting around. You're probably not going to run across it in every library, university library, if you have access to it, but again, I, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. I think it's past the copyright. I hope I'm not doing anything wrong here, um, but there is a version that you can you can see online. There's text that's been extracted from it as well as uh, photocopies that have been made of it. So 200 pages, imagine that. We, and, and these were from all over the world. And the, the thing I liked about the book is it broke it down like these are things relative to snow. It was a very, it was a very engineering-like approach to this thing. And some of them, you know, are things that we still hear today. And some of them, you know, is it, it, you go, okay, that's a saying, but how does it really apply? It's like... If it rains, the field will be wet. You know, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but that's kind of what it felt like to some of them. You go, okay, that's interesting. But he did. He collected these phrases from all over, I would say, the Western world. I, th- I think it would be a misnomer to say that he had things from, you know, Eastern Asia. And, but at the same time, I know they exist there as well, right? I mean, if I'm talking with, um, you know, a friend of mine who's who's from China, I'm sure that they can spew off different phrases that, you know, they've known or that, that have been part of their culture for equally as long, thousands of years, right? But, so this is going to be tilted a little bit, as always with things. I mean, I, I can't read Chinese, so it's going to be tilted a little bit with a, a Western tint to it. But we'll talk about that in, in, if things are applicable in other parts of the world. So let's dig into it. So I picked 10, and I, I think we've got time to get through 10 in today's episode. And these were, you know, some of them I had heard before. These, some of them were ones that I'd not heard before, but I thought were interesting. And and looking into them, uh, were used very fairly, fairly commonly in certain cultures. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to we're going to take a saying or a phrase, we're going to discuss the concept behind it, and then we're going to talk about, or, or you know, what led to the concept behind, it. and then then we're going to talk a little bit about whether it's fact or fiction. So let's start with the obvious. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Like I said, you can, if you need to put a land lover in there, you can put shepherd. Red sky in morning, sailors take warning. Very simply, this has to do with the type of clouds that are present at sunrise and sunset, at what level in the atmosphere, and the reflection of the fact that in the mid-latitudes, that weather generally travels from west to east. So it's a generalized phrase. And... More or less, what's, what it's boiling down to is the setup is such that good weather, if it's approaching from the west, is going to deliver a certain cloud structure so that sunsets are nice, bright, and red. Okay? And the reverse would be true in the morning. So if it's happening in the morning, it's a reflection that, that a low-pressure system is likely bringing storms and headed your way. Now, of course, this is conditional. This has to do with you know, normal behavior, though. So it, 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 with all these things, none of them are always true, right? And sometimes weather can, as we all know, can change drastically or you can get a shift in the, in the flow of weather that can lead to these outcomes not being the case. Or something happened, you know, maybe there, in a, and I will give you an example, you know, a lot of what helps with, with vivid sunsets is debris in the air and particulates in the air. So you could have a fire going on. And we had one this past year, this this big uh, wildfire that happened in Canada that delivered smoke all the way down to where I was in, in, in Atlanta. So think about that, very far away. But that smoke set up for, for vivid sunsets. And you even heard me mention it last week when we talked about the ash from the Krakatoa getting all the way around, halfway around the world and providing for vivid sunsets. So you've got this stuff going on. So it's it's not always the case, but the vast majority of the time it's a reflection of, you know, weather that's going to take place in the next 12 hours or so, 12 to 24 hours. So generally speaking, it's true. But, you know, interestingly, if you go to the tropics, it's not true, okay? Because of the way the weather flows up, it, you would tend to actually see the reverse. But that doesn't rhyme as well. So red sky at night, yeah, it's it's a good reflection. Red sky at night, you know, you're likely to be in store for fair, fair weather the next day. Uh, red sky in morning, well, your storm is probably on the way. Or in my case, you know, chance of storm and then no storm. Um, so let's go to another one. When windows won't open and the salt clogs the shaker, 
the weather will favor the umbrella maker. Now, this is this is simply getting down to the amount of humidity in the air. And again, it's it's very regionalized. So in some places, if you live in a region where humidity changes significant amounts from day to day or even the time of day, this would apply. So as humidity is increasing, it's giving you an idea that, that more moisture's in the air on the way and what happens you know that salt absorbs absorbs the moisture and it clogs the shaker wood absorbs moisture and so doors get stuck that maybe don't always get stuck now in this day and age if you don't have a wood door in your house you may never know this happens and with all the climate control we have inside places you know salt shakers don't always clog but morton salt a, a famous um manufacturer here in the u.s when it when it rains it pours and this had to do you know was built the phrase was built around the same kind of idea so again generally true it's a good sign but you could live in a place i mean we know it there's like you know islandy places that always have this problem and that's why a lot of times they put rice in the salt shaker because the rice will absorb the water better than the salt does and it keeps it broken up and from clumping as well all right a summer fog for fair a winter fog for rain. Now this this idea, again, it's generally true, and, and it really has to do with the way fog tends to form in summertime versus how it forms in the wintertime. Now in the summertime, usually a fog is forming. It's a, it's a sign of a temperature aversion, but it usually means that a lot of heat escaped, okay? And, and this, what's left is you're getting very close to when we have condensation. So, at that level in the air and you get this, that means actually fair weather is going on around you and once the fog clears, it's generally going to be a very nice day. Whereas winter, you tend to get fog setups when you have really cold air pushing over a warm area or you're set up in a coastal area where you've got these kind of different setups. Again, may not always apply the same in a coastal area, for instance. You, you know, you may get the setup because you live in an area that's got really cold you know, ocean currents um, that are off your coast and, you know, air blows over it every day and you get fog every day and it's, you know, winter or summer, it has nothing to do with the what necessarily the weather that's going on around it. But generally speaking, it's believed that this one, you know, it is true for a lot of continental land areas, let's say. So, Again, the science behind that one is just how fog sets up in these different seasons. All right, one that I never heard before, and it, it again, it's more of an old school kind of thing. Mackerel sky and mare's tails, lofty ships carry low sails. Now, as you can imagine, and you could already hear it, we're talking about ships with sails. So this is it's been around for a while. And if I'm remembering cl- correctly, the, the origin of this is believed to be in Great Britain or in that vicinity. Um, whether it's was exactly that, I, I can't say whether it was, you know, other parts of the aisles up there, it's possible. But the idea, again, is we're getting back to those same, those same cloud types, actually, that tell you of an, you know, a storm that's coming on the way, right? So it, it's giving you an idea that these higher clouds are a reflection, you know, if they're blowing in, are a reflection of stormy weather that's going to be, or lower clouds that are going to be coming after this. This one's a little more tricky because there are plenty of times when you get clouds of this type that, you know, it's not going to be blustery or whatever the next day. However, it, it's an understand what it's trying to convey is technically that the weather's going to get bad, so you you don't want to have your your, your sails fully extended. So the idea was there, but the reality is this is more hit and miss, right? There are many times when, hey, you know, this one's not going to come to pass. All right, another one, rain before 7, fine before 11. This one seems to be born out of the idea that it, where it came from, that storms just don't last that long, you know, that most rain is associated with a frontal event that, you know, is, is coming to pass. And as we all know, that again, anybody who lives in the mid-latitudes knows that quite often when rain blows through, it is, it's a... It's, uh, you know, it blows through over an hour or two or whatever it's going to be. But we also know that there are plenty of times, and I remember when I first moved to Atlanta, the first, I think it was the first three weeks um, that I was there, it rained every day. So 
uh, it, it definitely rained before 7 and after 11 <laughs> and then before 7 again and so on. So this one, again, kind of like the one before it. There are times when it's relevant, you know, with a normal passing, let's say a cold front and the rain that goes with a cold front, it usually blows over. But if you're in the tropics, you know, and you live in a rainforest, these things aren't necessarily going to be the case. That one's more like um, rain before 8, you know, no rain after midnight. I don't, you know, I don't know. And it it, it, it would vary wherever you are. But, but again, the idea is, and it is conveying a general concept that, Storms just tend not to last that long. That's that's the idea there. Idea there, and for many places, that may be the norm, but it's certainly not always the case. All right, dew on the grass, no rain will come to pass. Now, this has to do. You you guys have seen I did that evaporative cooling episode. This is the reverse of that, right? We're talking about condensation, and to get condensation at night, or to get where you've seen dewy or moisture grass. This gets back to the, kind of the same thing we were talking about with fall. You really need clear air for this to happen because if you don't, you know, one of the things I, I guess that we, we don't really, we don't always dig in the science here, but if you have clouds, clouds trap heat. Now, we're not going to get into all the science about what's going on there, but just know that when you've got a cloud layer above you, the night's not going to get as cold as if you could see the stars. And, and again, there were other ones like this that talked about starry skies um, or frost, same sort of thing. But they're all down to the same fundamental case, and frost being the same. It's, you know, you could have frost on the grass, uh, no no snow will come to pass. It's it's a similar concept that when we, we have this condensation take place, it means there's no wind, okay? Or I shouldn't say no wind, but the winds are likely light. And... All the heat is in the day is being able to escape to really create this environment that allows for condensation of some type, whether it's liquid or frozen type. And it usually means the next day is going to be great. So you know, you, those are usually the days that you can have these clear skies. But again, it's situational. That doesn't mean that you know even by this evening that, that stormy weather might be rolling in. All of it has to do with how quickly things are moving, right? But the concept is there and is valid. All right, let's let's get to one that's well-known. So, February 2nd in the U.S., Groundhog Day. Now, it's Candlemas Day in other places around the world, but they're, so they're saying sometimes that, that you may have heard about Candlemas versus Groundhog, but the idea is if he sees a shadow, you got another 30 days of winter. If not, spring is on the way. And you know what? This is just hedging bets, and there's not an a ounce of validity to it. But just think about it. Without it, we wouldn't have had Groundhog Day the movie. We wouldn't have a, a silly names for groundhogs. Puxatani Phil being the most well-known one here in the U.S. probably. Uh, but, you know, it, it, I don't know. It creates that kind of lore. And, and I think this it stems on a, something that's very important in what we're talking about. This was the first one where we talked about a little longer time scale. And that's going to be important when we kind of wrap up here. So keep in mind that that uh, something trying to talk about 30 days away or a season away uh, you know, might be a little more suspect. All right, when sound travels far and wide, a stormy day will be tied. I thought this was interesting because this was one that looked at not so much the weather, okay, of what was going on around it. And, and there were lots of them that got into animals, and I, I, I really I couldn't get into them. It was funny. It's like I think a lot of people – and some of the ones I read about animals, just so many of them were not true. But a lot of them were true, but maybe for the wrong reason. And this is one that, again, I, it, it doesn't get into animals, but it got into a non-weather event telling you about future weather, which I thought was kind of interesting. And the idea has some validity, some validity, because during summer or warm months, humid air, humid air, sound will carry further in and this it's a lot like these other things it's 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 actually the reflecting it in sound is just giving you an idea of what's going on in the atmosphere it's no different than red sky at night or red sky in morning sort of thing it's a similar setup you get a lot of moisture in the air or that's what it's conveying but in the winter time 
actually the opposite would be true. And I, it, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard it, but a lot of times in the winter, if if it's a crisp winter day and you hear l- really loud noise, and it it can almost surprise you, because you you do realize. And now some of people think, oh, it's because the leaves are off the trees. Well, actually, it has to do with the density of the air. Now, leaves being off the tree and not being there to muffle the sound is a great thing, and it may help. But but generally speaking, the density of the air allows that sound to travel further. So actually. That would happen on a clear day. So works in the summer or warm season, but not so much in the cold season. You would want just the opposite if you really want the sound to travel further. And actually, you don't want snow on the ground. Snow is a great dampener of sounds. So, again, situational, but in the right context, it can be useful. All right, in like a lion, out like a lamb. Many of us have heard this before. There's nothing to it. It's kind of like the Groundhog Day. The concept being pretty simple is... If you had a stormy week to start the month, and that would be contrary to this <laughs> rain before seven, fine by it might even be a, a counterintuitive that so, whole sort of thing. But you're just hedging your bets. So you know, if you had a stormy begin of the month, beginning of the month, you're saying it's not going to be that way towards the end. What you're trying to, what the idea that's being conveyed is, and this is particularly normal in the United States, is we have different regions that go through spring at different times. So, for instance, my main spring month may be April, let's say. And the idea there is that frontal passages are at their strongest as spring is starting, let's say. And towards the end of spring, we t- maybe you're not getting as strong as showers or the in- intense level of weather activity has moved a little bit to your north or your south, depending on the time of the year. But that's what's going on is, is you're, you're hedging a bet that that's what's going to happen. Sometimes it does. But like Groundhog Day, it's, you, you, can just, you may as well stick your finger out and go, huh, it's raining the beginning of the month, it's going to rain at the end. You could say, in like a lion, out like a lion, and actually be right in many cases. There, there's just no credibility to this saying. All right, so here we, we've gotten through a lot of them, and I, I know we're running short on time here, so let's let's hit one more. Chimney smoke descends, nice weather ends. And this is, a, this is one of those ones that it's right sometimes for different scientific reasons, and that's why I picked it. Sometimes it can be the amount of moisture in the air. Sometimes it can be the way the wind is blowing. But those same things don't necessarily always happen with weather events. So it's also not always accurate. Okay, so it's a little it's a little tricky when you look at it as it can be accurate. It can be accurate for multiple scientific reasons that have to do with the structure of the air and the flow of the air, but it's not necessarily a, an accurate predictor at all. So, all right, so we we hit on some big ones, and like I said, I I may get into to this topic or dig deeper into one again. You heard me mention the animal stuff. The animal ones were just more complicated. I could have probably spent a whole episode talking about just one or two and what was going on there, but uh, we'll, we'll do some more animal stuff. I know we did an episode in the back, but we'll do some more down the road. So let's summarize here, okay? What, what are we really talking about? Some are very good observations of, of the environment around them. Sometimes it can be regionalized, so do keep in mind just because something works where, you know, if you move from one place to another place, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be accurate. And sometimes these phrases just have no validity whatsoever. Almost always it's about playing the odds. In no case is any one of them always going to be right, okay? But in a lot of cases, and, you know, the ones that prevail, I think, and are not what we would call old wives' tales, I still need to dig into that saying. It's all about playing the odds. Time span considered is is a very important thing to keep in mind because usually the shorter the duration you're talking about, like if you're talking about something happened tonight and here's what tomorrow is going to be like, it's more likely to have validity than things you look at with longer time scales like the groundhogs or lion and lamb. But there, there's some obvious ones and some of them were just common sense. You know, a year of snow, crops will grow. Well, that's a that's a reflection that you've got this extra moisture, okay, that's you're starting your season with a with more gonna have moisture in the soil. So even if it is or isn't a rainy spring, the melt of the snow is going to provide extra moisture to the soil around it. So it's it's logical enough. However, it doesn't mean it's always going to be true. There's a lot of reasons, you know, it, Georgia started 
you know, the year without a drought. And here I am sitting in just a horrible drought. So it, it is very situational. Just because someone wrote it down doesn't make it true. Always remember that, folks. Just because it's written down, and I don't care what you're looking at, doesn't make it true. Or just because someone said it doesn't make it true. Okay, enough about sayings. Hopefully you've enjoyed this this dig into them. And, you know, they're, they're, they're always interesting no matter what. I, I'd recommend taking a look at that book if you find this topic interesting. And I'll put a couple articles in the in the show notes. So if you want to look at maybe a shorter list, you can do that too. Now, the interesting tidbit, and one you didn't hear me say, is under the weather, hearing the phrase under the weather. It is not a weather phrase at all. It's actually nautical in nature, and it just has to do with when you're not feeling well on a ship, you usually go below deck to get out of the weather. Okay, so I am going to really, I am going to try to do that non-aqueous rain episode next week, but I may or may not get around to it. And I actually want to talk about weather modification in general. We hit on this with last week's topic a little bit, but I want to talk about it in, you know, what actually, what's been done and what hasn't been done and how real is this kind of stuff. So let's wrap it up here. You know how to get the website, whatisitabouttheweather.com. Want to get in touch with us? What is it about the weather at gmail.com or use the form on the website either way. And again, your support is incredible to us being able to continue what we do here. You know the thing, the drill, RSVP, rate, share, validate, and pledge. So until next time, until next time, may you have interesting and enjoyable weather. And always keep in mind that there's much more to weather than the weather itself.